background about myself, I've been working at St. John for almost five years now. And I have been working in the breast center for almost a year now, uh, which is nice. And I see like some familiar faces. I haven't met all of you yet. Um, so basically today's topic, and this is something a lot of people often ask us, sometimes specific supplements or just like dietary supplements in general. So I thought I would like start the nutrition sessions or, or the series, I guess, with the dietary supplements. Um, and like Becky said, I'll be happy to take questions towards the end. Okay, so today's agenda is basically, I wanna highlight some of the common dietary supplements and their purposes and roles that they play. Um, give me one second. Okay. Um, and then discuss how effective they are when we talk about like breast cancer prevention, treatment or management, like side effects uh, to related to the treatments and stuff. And if you are taking any of those dietary supplements, what are some of the risks associated with them, if there is any? So that would be my focus. Um, and when I talk about dietary supplements, I feel like it's a big umbrella. So I want to like um, explain that a little bit. So vitamins, minerals also come under the umbrella of dietary supplements. Anything that's like botanical, herbal, um, some like energy drinks, like protein shakes and stuff can also come under this dietary supplements. But today's um, um, presentation will focus on the dietary supplements, things like herbal or botanical supplements that people often take, you know, for various health purposes or reasons. So why do some people or why do people take dietary supplements? So the most common um, answer that we often get is for general wellness and disease prevention. Some people take it to boost their immune system, um, to improve their energy. Some people just want to focus on their whole body, like mind, body, and spirit. Um, oftentimes, people also take it just to like for their brain function, to improve their memory on concentrations. So those are the common reasons. Again, just to like um, uh, differentiate between what is dietary and again, dietary supplement is like a bigger umbrella. Herbal supplements can also go under the dietary supplements. So basically, dietary supplements is things that you can take orally. And it comes in a form of like tablet, capsule, um, powder, or liquid. Um, and it, they are made to supplement your diet, right? Um, they can have more than one ingredient. And again, vitamins, minerals, herbs, other botanicals, amino acids, enzymes, and tissue from different organs and glands or extracts of these can be um, considered dietary supplements. Um, and then the herbal supplements are sometimes called botanicals, and they are coming from mainly from the plant sources, the algae, the fungi, or the combination of them. Or they often are made into teas, um, also extracts, tablets, powder, or capsules. Okay. So I think my focus is more so on the herbal supplements, dietary supplements, and a little bit of them, the other ones as well. Um, it's so dietary supplements oftentimes come under the complementary or alternative um, medicine often found in like think of like the Chinese medicine or so. I feel like a lot of people are like helping themselves to treat, treat themselves with the dietary um, supplements. More commonly consumed dietary supplements would be like the top one is like the fish oil, uh, often take, taken for the heart health to glucosamine or chondroitin, often taken for like joint health. Prebiotics, probiotic for the gut, gut health, melatonin for sleep, um, garlic, ginseng, ginkgo, and these are the other ones. What comes to mind when we're talking about this um, dietary supplements is, are they safe? What, what do we know about them? So the good thing is that um, from the NIH, um, they have this program called the NTP or National Toxicology Program. And they conduct multiple studies to identify the potential harm for the short-term and the long-term exposure to botanical dietary supplements. And then the data is then used by the different associate or different organizations like USDA. And the age itself uses this information. But the so they are studying these supplements. But the bad part is that they are done in labs. So oftentimes either in rats or mice the data or the studies haven't been done on human for the most part, and which is the sad part. These are just some of the common um, dietary supplements that NTP is currently researching. 
I'll be honest with you, I've never even heard of many of these names, but it is interesting and it shows like the common use for them. Um, again, I don't have data on them, but they are under ongoing. Um, and then this, they have like a list of um, dietary supplements that they have done the research on. Again, it's done in lab um, and we'll try to pick up what it has to say with associated with the breast cancer, breast cancer, sorry. Um, the common ones that I'll talk about will probably be aloe vera that people often ask me about, the green tea, ginkgo, ginseng, milk thistle. So these would be the common ones that I will highlight here. One thing I do want to mention, are dietary supplements um, regulated? So under the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, um, they are defined as dietary supplements, um, and it's coming from the FDA. They are oftentimes sold over the counters and manufacturers are just making them. The bad thing is that they are not as heavily regulated as a prescripted medications would be. Meaning that FD is not regularly, um, again, studying them, not per, uh, or having a study done on human. It's just whatever the manufacturer sort of wants to claim as long as it seems sort of true, they can claim it and sell it. So again, there's no registration required by the FDA before the dietary supplements goes to the market. Um, we don't know the safety and effectiveness in, in uh, same as the prescribed medication would be. Um, and FDA is not regulating how, what the potency, the, the dosage, the purity of the supplement itself. Um, and yes, they have to have some type of a labeling. The manufacturer have to have some type of a labeling as long as it's true but it's basically coming from the manufacturer themselves. They can say, oh, it boosts your immune system, but honestly, we don't really know. Common ones, the supplements that I will highlight would be these ones, green tea, turmeric, resveratrol. These three are often, um, yes, you can take them as a dietary supplement too, but they can, you can just get them from the food sources too. You don't have to have them in a supplemental form. Um, turmeric, you know, it's, it comes from the root. People can add it to their cooking. Um, resveratrol, the common, when I say this word, people think of red wine, but wine isn't something, or alcohol in general isn't something that we recommend people to take, especially when they're getting some type of a treatment. But you can get the resveratrol effects from dark um, fruits, for example, plums or berries or cherries, for example. Um, then the other ones would, are often found in like a supplement form, so I'll cover them. Why take dietary supplements? Again, for most part, people are just trying to improve the quality of their life. Um, and if they are having any type of like chemotherapy or radiation, they want to help minimize the um, side effects related to it. And to also just to like control the cancer growth, cancer cell growth. However, a lot of the oncologists or practitioners or experts like myself, we wouldn't recommend people to take dietary supplements, especially while they're having active treatments. Um, and if you are taking something, let us know. We can look more into it. We want to we want to make sure that it's not interacting with any of your chemotherapy or radiation therapy, or it's not interacting with any of your other drugs. Um, it is recommended to stop taking, if you are to have a surgery, it is recommended to stop taking dietary supplements at least two weeks before your surgery. And then obviously, obviously let us know. So dietary supplements and breast cancer. Um, what I found is that in different um, supplements, yes, they try to do a little bit of research just in cancer in general or different types of cancer. I wasn't always able to find what type of role that supplement has with the breast cancer, but I'll try my best to highlight highlight what the uh, the supplement is doing and what kind of role it has with the cancer activity. Okay, so I'll get right into it and I'll start with the green tea. Again, the top, the first thing that I will talk about are more so like the antioxidants. Again, you can get them from the food sources too. Um, so the green tea have this compound molecule, cannot pronounce the word, but it's EGCG. It's a polyphenol that is extracted from the green tea and it has shown that it does have anti-cancer actions. So what, I, what we found was um, in multiple studies, a lot of these people were drinking at least five cups of green tea. And what we found was that there was a reduction of 15 to 17% in either 
for those who were at risk of developing breast cancer we saw reduction and then it also reduced the chances of getting the recurrence of breast cancer so that is something that i always recommend to my patients to if you aren't already drinking green tea drink green tea and if you are drinking green tea continue to drink it um however i wasn't able to find how much somebody should be drinking in the studies they were drinking at least five cups of it and i'm not sure how what was the dosage of it what is like how many tablespoons of teaspoon was in there or not yarush there's a request that you slow down a bit okay i'm sorry okay i'll try my best thank you move right along next one is the turmeric um again it's an antioxidant it can reduce the risk of many cancers too it's Turmeric is considered um, anti-inflammatory. Um, it's found a lot of people, if we are looking into like the East, oh, sorry, Asian cuisine, Southeast Asia or Asian cuisine, people use turmeric in their cooking. Um, and not, I don't, I haven't seen the prevalence of the breast cancer, but like cancer in general, in that region of the world, it's pretty low. We could contribute to turmeric or it could be another factor too, but I just wanted to highlight that. Um, there aren't as many risk factor and it is a spice. So sometimes people can get upset stomach if they're taking too much of the turmeric powder. Um, a lot of the manufacturing company, they are selling it as like a supplement or in a pill form or so. Um, or if you want, you can add it to your cooking too. So what we found was in the lab on reds, um, it suggests that turmeric may be able to reduce the growth of cancer cells. However, there hasn't been studies done in a human. And that's like the common um, trend that you will see in a lot of these dietary supplements, that the research have not been done in humans, it's only in the labs. Next one is the resveratrol. Again, we think of like red wine or other, other dark, um, but uh, sorry, fruits also has this type of uh, antioxidants in them. And this one is also has cancer protective effects in them. So a study done in the 39 women for over a 12-week randomized trial who were at increased risk of developing breast cancer, they were given the resveratrol. And what we found was that there was a decrease in the tumor suppressor gene in the breast cancer patient. So again, I don't know how much the dosage wasn't um, specified in the research, but again, if you are eating these types of foods on general, hopefully it's um, lowering the chances of breast cancer development. Decreased. Oh. I'm talk about like some other. So those were like more of the antioxidant effects, and then people often take them as a supplement. And then I'm now talking about some of the dietary supplements that people just get from like the plant-based sources or um, like the herbal sources. So the ginkgo biloba, the fun thing about uh, sorry, uh, it, it plays a role in brain function and memory, and then it was actually it's a lot of people use it. So National Cancer Institute wanted NTP to research this um, supplement to see um, the toxicity and the carcinogenicity of this um, dietary supplement. So what we found was over the two year studies in mice, um, there was an increase in liver cells in male and female mice. And then there was also an increase in thyroid cancers in, in thyroid cancer in male and female rats and male mice. Um, and human, we found that it did improve the memories, but I didn't find any um, in association or kind of a role ginkgo biloba would have on the breast cancer. Aloe vera is another one. Oftentimes people take it for either like if you get like a cut or a bruise or something, people take it and it helps soothe your skin. Some people also take it for if they're having constipation or something. Aloe vera, one thing I want to highlight, um, on the latex or the outer layer of the aloe vera, there's this compound, I guess, called anthroquinone. It has laxative properties in them. So sometimes people take aloe vera with this compound to help them help them with the constipation but for the most part it's for the healing purposes right um and if somebody's having like mucositis related to the therapies or something they can use it as a mouthwash too and it helps soothe for at least for temporary purposes um you can do a swish and swish but the breast cancer however um no research shows any benefit 
either taken orally or topically. However, it can help with the burns temporarily. So somebody who's getting radiation, if they wanted to apply aloe vera, it may help you temporarily, but it does not prevent the burn from the radiation therapy. Regalis, hopefully I'm pronouncing these words right too. Um, so the, the people, the reason people take it is to, again, to improve their immune system um, and also the liver health and to also reduce the risk of cancer. There haven't been any side effects reported or not that I found in the research, but it is recommended that if somebody who is taking like drugs that suppresses their immune system to not take this type of supplements. Um, I didn't find much research on them and I mean, they haven't been done in human. Um, the lights on, uh, the ding dings and the door, if it isn't closed, I can hear somebody talking. Ice melted and the ice cream had melted and et cetera. So I was wondering if the water. Okay, should I just keep going? I guess. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, melatonin. Please. Yes, melatonin. Um, it's so it's a hormone that our body also produces, right? It's for, it plays a role in sleep cycle. It is also claimed as an antioxidant that reduces cell damage and boosts the immune system. Uh, let your doctor know if you are taking melatonin or if you plan on taking melatonin. Um, it may interact with blood thinners or other medication. Um, so basically, the per, uh, what they have found is that they found lower levels of melatonin with the people who are getting less sleep, right? And it makes sense. If you're not getting enough quality sleep, you might be lacking in melatonin. And what we have found is that there's a higher risk of developing breast cancer. Um, so in labs, melatonin appeared to slow the growth of breast, breast cancer cells. The best thing I would say is that, um, yes, it's not the topic of today, but sleep is very important. And not just the quantity of the sleep, but the, sorry. Yeah, not the quantity of the sleep, but the quality of the sleep, right? Where we are, so you, our, we, our body is like naturally producing melatonin, um, keeping your, improving your immune system too. Right. And if somebody is not having a good sleep, that is related to stress or whatever reason, you can talk to your doctor. You can start taking the melatonin just to improve your sleep. And in, at least in the lab, it's showing that it slows the growth of the breast cells. However, again, it's not the research hasn't been done so much on the human and we don't know how it relates to the breast cancer. But overall, just getting a good quality sleep can improve your immune system, too. Oh, thistle seed. Um, the idea is that it reduces the changes that are in the liver function that are caused by chemotherapy. And then some people just take it just to reduce their risk of cancer. So the risk associated with this type of a supplement is that it can interact with the chemotherapy drugs. So obviously while you're getting the chemotherapy, do not take this type of a uh, supplement. Um, and it is extracted from the parts of the plants other than the seed. And sometimes it may increase the estrogen levels in the body. And I know a lot of us or a lot of the patients are also after their treatment are on the estrogen blocking pills. So in the lab, research suggests that milk thistle may reduce the growth of cancer cells. Again, no research done on the human. The mushroom. Um, so it, this one has an active ingredient called the beta glucan polysaccharide, which can boost immune system. Again, the studies haven't been done in human. However, we don't know this, uh, the common or the known side effects of it. In the lab, in mice, it has shown to increase the immune response where they were developing more bone marrow cells, and we saw a reduction in the toxic effect. Otherwise, there is no clear evidence that it is effective in the breast cancer. Vitamin D, so it's a supplement. Um, vitamin D, we can get it from the sun, but we have to be careful, right? Because of skin cancers and other things. Um, it plays an important role with the absorption of calcium in our bone. Um, it's important for the menopause of women and women taking the aromatose inhibitor to treat breast cancer, since one of the side effects of those inhibitor drugs is bone loss density, right? For many years, studies have shown that people who are less exposed to sunlight and have a lower levels of vitamin D as a result are more likely to develop breast cancer and other forms of cancer. So oftentimes I have seen like a lot of doctors will prescribe 
it tends to take calcium and or vit vitamin D and or the calcium. Um, it may help protect premenopausal women against breast cancer, and we still need to do a little bit more studies into that. Um, glutamine is another one, and it's used for the peripheral neuropathy, diarrhea, mucositis, and it's more so when somebody's having some type of a treatment like chemotherapy or radiation, and they are experiencing those type of um, side effects. What we saw was in the short term, um, the glutamine did help with these side effects, but in the long term and the use of high doses um, during active can cancer, um, it's not recommended to take it. We don't have like the killer results, but the doctors or the experts are not recommending it. And it remains unknown how glutamine may be affecting the cancer growth overall. I think that was the last of my um, the supplement that I wanted to highlight. The bottom line is, again, more research needs to be done, but I wanted to show what has been happening in the lab setting, what's been happening with the mice and rats. Um, Again, it's not something that we will commonly recommend patients to start. If you haven't been taking it, don't take it. The bottom line is that most of your nutrients should be coming from the whole foods itself. Your body will figure it out and it will, whatever it needs, whether it's antioxidants, whether it's like multivitamins and minerals that your body can get it from the food source for the most part. Try to make your meals more balanced, right? You don't have to rely on the supplements to boost your immune system or for whatever reasons, get a good night's sleep, get a balanced three meals at least, stay active, um, and then let your body take its course basically. And I think with that, I will end my presentation and I am open to questions now. Thank you, Yaruj. There was one in the chat about melatonin mm -hmm. and whether it raises or lowers reproductive hormone levels. I'm not sure if it's increasing or uh, lowering it, but it was it was having an effect on the reproductive hormone levels in women. I'll see if I can find out while we you answer another question from the group. Niruj, thank you very much. I have a question. Sure. You mentioned, uh, I think it was turkey something tail, mushrooms. Yeah. Is that one kind of mushroom or in general all mushrooms? It's a specific kind of mushroom. So there's another one. Um, I didn't look into that one yet because I often get questions about the turkey tail mushroom and it affects on the liver. So I just wanted to highlight that. But no, there are different types of mushrooms. If you're getting mushrooms from the food sources, for example, like shiitake mushroom or something, oftentimes they're not being used as a dietary supplement. They're just being used in cooking. So that one is generally safe to be consumed unless somebody's immune system is, you know, um, lower if you're getting like a chemotherapy that's the time that we would recommend not to take it um, but other than that if your immune system is okay you can eat the mushrooms just wanted to highlight what the turkey tail is doing in our body okay. thank you and i found one source that says that when combined with progesterone melatonin at high doses actually suppresses ovulation so when someone is pregnant um plasma levels of melatonin rise naturally, if that helps answer that question. I think one of the things that troubles me about supplements is there are so many dose ranges of the supplements and the quality of the products range. So what you absorb from that uh, supplement may not even be the actual dose that it says uh, because of its formulation. I know I got turmeric and I started taking it um, and I don't remember why, <laughs> I, I don't remember why, but I started getting a really upset stomach. So I just stopped altogether. And I, I love the idea that if we could eat a more balanced diet with natural foods, we'd all be better off. Um, and I think the supplementation is like a hurry up, get it in kind of coping. I had a question regarding calcium. You didn't mention it in your um, presentation at all, but when you're taking the aromatase inhibitors, uh, you know, there's an issue with bone density, and I wondered if there was a recommended dosage for calcium supplements and which calcium would be the better one absorbed. Okay, so the question is basically about the calcium and um, related to the aromatase inhibitor. 
Um, I would say, so typically I'd recommend a daily dosage of calcium for women over the age of 50 is 1200 milligram. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can get it from the food source. I think uh, somebody asked me uh, before that my presentation began to, what are some of the sources of calcium? So dairy is a common one, but it doesn't have to only be from like the milk. It could be, the sources could be from, you know, cheese, low fat cheeses, you want to do yogurt, soy-based item, green leafy vegetables, and oftentimes things that are fortified with calcium will give you some of them. When you're talking about in terms of the supplement, like a pill form, um, typically calcium that comes with calcium carbonate um, has like a more bioavailability of the Perfect. calcium. Okay. Yes. That in a, in a pill form. But again, the idea is, I will get to you. Um, the idea is that you want to not take all the supplements at the same, like at once. You want to space it out. That's the idea of like eating the calories too, right? You want to space it out between breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So if you are including like calcium sources at each meal, your chances of you absorbing it are more. So for example, if you're taking a pill form, maybe about 50 to 60% is getting absorbed. The rest are just going to the waste. So if you do it like multiple times a day, the chances are you're absorbing a little bit more each time. Thank you. I hope that answers. Yes. I think, yes, you can go. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but it says like, and you have to unmute yourself. I can't hear you. <laughs> so I was confused with, um... When they say something increases or decreases tumor suppression, mm -hmm. and I think it was the ginkgo biloba, um, the last line was in mice, maybe it increased or it decreased tumor suppression. So I'm always confused whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers that slide, but I, I couldn't tell whether that- get to that. Yeah. I think that was the one, it was the second or third one that you uh, presented after the um, green tea. And is there any way to have green tea without the caffeine? Um, I think they do make it with decaf. Let me answer the second part of the question first. Um, okay. I think they do Thank make you. green tea with decaf or something, but there is going to be like a little bit of the caffeine is going to be part of it, even if it's decaf. Hmm. I think for the most part, green tea has some caffeine in it. I was talking about it in terms of the resveratrol, um, okay. how it had the decrease, the methylation of the tumor suppressor gene in breast right. cancer patient. Right. Um, what is saying that so tumor suppressor gene um, at a DNA or at a molecular level, I think we all have this type of a gene. Um, at the, again, the molecular level, there's this methylation that can turn the cell into a tumor causing cell. So when we saw the decrease in the methylation of it, of it, it was lowering your chances of developing the cancer. Okay. And that was okay. So that was about that one. I that was about the resveratrol. That's what the resveratrol was doing. It was decreasing the methylation process. Is that, good? is that good or bad? That's a good thing. So resveratrol, the antioxidant itself, it's lowering, so you're not developing the breast cancer cells. So okay. that's a good thing, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and is the caffeine in green tea in any way related to the positive effects? I know some of it ends up in, even if you get it, decaf. Specific compound was that was the EGCG that was extracted from the green tea that was having the effect of the anti cancer growth. It's not caffeine related. Okay, because even in coffee, uh, the actual caffeine is supposed to, is thought to be part of the benefit. Uh, so when you drink decaf, you get a little less of the whatever the benefits are, the flavonoids or whatever in coffee. Um, so I was curious. Well, thank you very much. That's yeah, helpful. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. Other questions from the group? That was helpful. Okay, thank you.